Oops. Thank you. Oh, sure. Well, we have a small group, which is good. With this type of lecture, please um, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question at any time. What I'm going to really do is talk about, uh, I, I've altered the presentation. This basically says that uh, I, I have no financial interest with anybody. Uh, I'm trying to keep standards high. I've been doing this 20 years, and it's all based on uh, evidence-based medicine. Uh, when you have a smaller group, if you do have a question, instead of waiting till the end when you've probably forgotten your question, feel free to ask. And I mean, I don't mind going off topic if that's the case. I've changed my presentation a little bit because uh, about three or four weeks ago, I, w I went over to Joy Muller's course on malfunctional therapy. And really, that, that was a transformational seminar for me. And so I've added a fair amount of this lecture about that, and it deals mostly with the pediatric aspect of, dental, of sleep medicine. But to a great degree, uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of adults. I mean, I brought, a, I brought into my practice a Ph.D. speech therapist, Dr. Stephanie Jasuda. We're here in Austin. And uh, she's an ex-clinical director at University of Texas School of Speech Pathology. She's been working with autistic children and adults that couldn't speak for the last 30 years, teaching them to speak. And um, we're actually starting to see, or she's going to be seeing, because I'm not going to do it, her first patients next week. And they're all adults. And so it's, it's really extremely fascinating to me. We're developing, uh, I'm a beta site to develop a uh, electronic EMR or an EMR electronic medical record for myofunctional therapy. Because right now in speech therapy, most of them are still doing everything by hand notes, and we want to get out of that. But what we're going to do, I'm going to first jump in with myofunctional therapy. And really what myofunctional therapy is, I'm not going to say in the old days or traditionally, but it was usually dealing with tongue thrust and, and the sounds with the uh, T and ST. This is really now dealing with the airway. And it's really mostly out of Brazil. All the re In fact, in Brazil, it's now uh, federal law that when a child is born, they have to check to see if it's tongue-tied or not. And if it is, it has to be clipped. Uh, and so really what we're dealing with here is the re neuromuscular repattering and re-education, re the oral facial muscles tongue, et cetera, and it, it, it involves the therapy, the modification is used to promote tongue position, improve breathing, chew, chewing, and swallowing. It is not speech therapy. So when you do go, if you do decide to do this, and I can't recommend her course high, I mean, you should get over there and take it as soon as you can. She's 68 years old. I don't know how much longer she's going to be doing this. She practices in Hollywood. Uh, but the point is, is it? I mean, it, it was really a dynamite course. But if you are talk, if you are considering this, the last thing you want to do is go in there and, and uh, I, I believe I'm going to be only hiring speech therapists for my company called Austin Myofunctional Therapy. I'm only going to be hiring speech therapists. But the last thing you want to do is cross roads or butt heads with speech therapists who are going, well, you're doing what I'm doing. No, we're not. This is completely different. It's an adjunctive aspect to. To, so that you can be working with speech therapists. This is what we're doing. Yes? Joy Muller. She practices in Pacific Palisades. She's a dental hygienist. And she gets beat up pretty much so on dental town. I'm a fool for going on dental town. It's just me. I just do it for fun. Why not? And, uh, I mean, there are times when I'll actually, uh, what, what happened here? Running system auto. Oh, well, I guess we changed there. Uh, I get on dental town and kind of say my mind at times, and I, I've gotten to the point where I'll get on there and I'll just yell to my wife, hey, honey, but you know what's going to hit the fan? I'm putting this up there because it's the truth. I'm, I'm not selling a product. I'm not pushing someone's appliance. Actually, I was making a comment about one thing, and I got an email from uh, a uh, manufacturer for an appliance, sure, telling me if I keep saying it, I'm going to get sued. So I didn't say anything. I went to go check with my malpractice carrier and with my, you know, insurance carrier, and so I'll say what I want now because, you know, this to me is something that needs to get out. But I definitely would take her course. She's in Pacific Palisades, but I think her next course is later this month. Yeah, I didn't – it did it on its own. Um, I think there's one next, next – uh, or the end of this month in Washington, D.C., It's a four-day, eight-hour-day course. Pretty intense.
But this is really what we're looking at is when you see a kiddo like that. What's interesting, and I'm going to go over some clinical aspects. I think we'll get to the end with this without a problem, but I'm looking at patients differently now. When a patient comes in, I ask them to uh, stand for me with a side view because I'm looking for the plumb line, middle ear down through the acromion process. they got a forward head position. There's an old saying, the head follows the tongue. When they're walking around like this, they're probably tongue-tied. They're tongue-tied. That needs to be dealt with. If you're going to have someone a lingual phrenectomy done, whereas I used to just send them off to have it done. Now after taking her seminar, patients go through a specific set of exercises the, starting the day of the surgery so that we don't get reattachment. But have your patients swallow. When you start to see the crinkling of the mentalis, that's probably a low tongue level. They can't get a proper tongue position to swallow. Same thing with this. You want lip seal. When you, can, you have a child that drools, this is lip seal. This can all be dealt with with myofunctional therapy because, in essence, you're strengthening with isotonic and isometric exercises the inherent muscle tone of the bicular source, which this child doesn't have. Where's the tongue level? In essence, right behind, between the first and second rugae, behind eight and nine, is where your tongue should sit. So everybody just kind of check and relax. Is your tongue behind eight and nine in that area? If it's not, it's a low tongue level issue with a low tongue level is, is that your tongue is lower and more posterior in your airway. If it's up and out of, if it's up behind your uh, eight and nine where it should be, you've now got some compensatory forces lingually to the maxillary arch and when you see a child with a low tongue level, the forces from just the cheeks are going to compress that palate along with the fact that they don't have, uh, um, probably weren't breastfed, so they're going to have a narrow palatal, narrower palatal arch. But we've got a case right now. It's one of our first two cases. She had a um, 50-year-old lady, and she's been seeing a uh, physical therapist, very good physical therapist, and he, I think he's certified with the AAO, whatever, you know, Association of Facial, Cranial Facial People. Um, and uh, up until the late 90s, well, she had two nasal surgeries in the late 90s. What's the reason? She had to be a mouth breather. She couldn't breathe through her nose. Now she can breathe through her nose. Well, a mouth breather usually has a low tongue level. So low tongue level, head, for, head follows the tongue, low tongue level. Children and adolescents, will you'll see them sitting there with their mouth open going, you know, breathing like that. Adults you don't see walking around breathing like that. So they're keeping their lips closed, which is causing chronic activation of the temporalis and masseter, which can cause, I mean, you know, it's a cascading effect. So... That's why it's important with this lady where she's not, she's not sleep apneic, but we're going to have her go through myofunctional therapy because she has a low tongue level, and she's still having TMJ symptoms. Does the tongue rest at the top of the roof of the mouth, or I, I like that one with a dog, or does her tongue stick out of your mouth at times? As far as posture is concerned, what is it? The uh, head weighs about like a bowling ball, 12 to 18 pounds. When you start seeing these people walking around like this, and then you ask them, hey, do you have neck or back problems? Sure do. Well, the farther your head comes forward, I mean, you can increase the weight of the head 30 to 40 pounds. So it, it's, it's a dynamic situation. Of course, when I go to the grocery store, now all I'm doing is looking at everybody's plumb lines. It's, it's ridiculous. But then when you look at this person here, all right, plumb lines off, ears there, shoulders there. But look, he's probably got long face syndrome, mouth breather. Looks like he's got some shadowing underneath his eyes. Okay, so I mean, he fits the profile. And I believe it's by age seven, what the face is like, uh, uh, 70 per, 60 or 70 percent formed by age 12, it's like 90 percent. So the sooner you can get these kids, the better off you are from a cosmetic viewpoint. I'm just going to go through evidence based medicine here as far as this is concerned to really back up what we're saying here. And that is, is that. Nasal breathing, whoops, hit the wrong thing there, I'm sorry. Nasal breathing, is that me? No. Nope. Upper air resistance during sleep and the propensity to have OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, is lower when you're breathing through your nose. The other interesting thing, too, is that when you're a nasal breather, about upwards of about 20% of the nitric oxide is produced in the nasal turbinates. You humidify. Nitric oxide kills funguses, bacteria, viruses. You're purifying the air. When you get a child 
who's, who's uh, breathing through their mouth, you're drying the tonsils out, that's causing uh, inflammatory cofactors to be formed plus histamine, which aggravates the allergies and asthma. So with myofunctional therapy, we're trying to get lip seal, mouth breathing, address mouth breathing, deal with a high palatal vault for the airway, improper chewing pattern, tongue thrust, speech, ther speech issues, gum disease, you know, dry mouth as far as periodontal issues are concerned, posture and orthodontic relapse. Pink incident starts from between age two and six when the tonsils start to get larger. And as far as when I'm sending someone off to an ENT for tonsil, you know, for TNA, I'm telling the patients to go with coblation. Some of the ENTs are still taking out the tonsils, you know, to get the sac. I mean, that's a two-week convalescent period. That's rough surgery. I had that done when I was in my 20s. But for a kiddo, if you use coblation, where they basically dissolve the tonsils, it's, very, it's virtually bloodless, very little convalescence. I tell the parents, get coblation done. If he won't do it, go somewhere else. And if they leave a little tissue, in the studies I've read, if there are little bits left, fine. Ten years from now, you can remove some more if you need. But it's very, you know, it's much less traumatic to that extent. But once again, 10% of the kids, that's an awful lot of children. Yes, sir. No, find a new ENT. I mean, there are going to be times you're going to butt heads with them. I, I had one ENT tell me, and there's a study in here basically. Uh, in fact, she's coming to my first seminar because myofunctional therapy, I'm giving seminars in my office building now for physicians every eight weeks. But she said, well, I wait till they're, if, if the tonsils aren't a two plus, which is pretty decent size, I'm not going to do anything. And her child is a mouth breather, and she can't understand what to do. She's taking the tonsils out, but there's more things involved with this. Well, as it says here, you know, you'll see with the, with, with the evidence-based aspect, it's not dose-dependent. You don't have to have real apnea in a child to have the symptoms. You can have mild symptoms causing issues. And, and so, you know, I don't care if it's a one or a one and a half. If that kid's got symptoms, to me, you do it. This is, the big, this is the big study. This was through Yeshiva University, 11,000 kids over six years. And I mean, and it showed, clearly shows sleep disorder breathing symptoms precede behavioral problems and strongly suggests that the sleep disorder is causing the problems. You know, uh, the whole thing is observe snoring, mouth breathing, or witness apneas. And when you're, when you're seeing a patient, don't just go, well, how's that child, how's your child sleeping? You want to ask, does your child snore? Do they mouth breathe? Are you seeing them stopping breathing? They found by age seven, if it's not treated, 40 to 100% of them have issues, and the biggest one is hyperactivity. I mean, this, it's airway. And this is what I was talking about as far as what you ask your patients. You want to be specific. Do they snore? Do they mouth breathe? And they feel that this has been caused because of the decreased oxygen levels with increased CO2 in the prefrontal cortex, interrupting the restorative processes and disrupting various cellular and chemical processes. What they're finding is the type of a neurocognitive deficit. It impacts executive functioning as far as to plan ahead, organize. The biggest thing is uh, emotional control or ADD. And this is the biggie. I mean, what I've done for when... Actually, September 24th, the next one's December 3rd, I'm inviting to my office building because I've set up a business now called Austin Myofunctional Therapy. And I've brought Dr. Jasud on, and it's going to be a fully separate business than, than what I have with dental sleep medicine. But every, every uh, eight weeks, I'm inviting 30 physicians and dentists, or orthodontists, pedodontists, pediatric sleep, ENTs, uh, speech therapists, function, uh, physical therapists, and I'm exposing them to this. And this is the biggie right here. So in, in, you've heard the old saying, well, they'll grow out of it. Well, this st study shows that you don't. If the symptoms go away, you're still going to have a scenario where 40 to 50% will still have be behavioral issues. 
and you need to get them treated as soon as possible. This basically states that. The reason I put these in here, I've given you all the evidence base and if it's on there so that you can go back and just go boom, 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 right to the physician when he has it. You know, he says, well, what about this? Well, here's this. And, and that's what I want. And that's, I've got an actual packet set up with the uh, studies in them, the first page of the study, synopsis, you know, the conclusion, how it's all there. For every one of these, I've got 29 studies. I think it's 20, somewhere in the 20 to 29 range. Uh, for each doctor. So it's all evidence-based. I mean, it's not listening to Martin. It's, hey, this is what's out there. Now, I know you can't read everything every day, so I'm going to bring this up here for you. And when you start talking about to mothers, this is last week I lectured the Texas Society of Nurse Practitioners State Convention in San Antonio. And it was a group like this. It was I had about 30 people in there. And when I finished talking about this, because I modified my lecture again, just like I did with this one, to include malfunctional, I got tackled on the way off the podium by two uh, administrators for Texas State University School of Nurse Practitioners. And they, the whole time, one of them was going, every time you said that, I was going, that's my son, that's my son, that's my son. Well, November 21st, I'm now speaking to the senior class of, nurse, of the university nurse practitioners. I will be speaking probably to the freshmen and all the students, and uh, I'll probably be made an adjunct professor at Texas State University. The point I'm saying is for you all to get into something like this in your hometown and you do it in a certain way where it's not a cottage industry where I'm just going to treat my dental patients I pick up on, that's what, this is, that's what we need. These, it's not fair to these kids. 50% of the kids were initially treated no longer had... ADD after tonsillectomy, had no, you know, uh, TNA. Now, this is the one that's interesting, and once again, I put this in there, is that tonsillar science did not predict the severity. The adenoids might as far as low oxygen level, but that'll go along with symptoms. So the point is, if it's a two and a half or, or, or a, a one and a half, whatever, it's the symptoms in my mind as a dentist, of course, go talk to an ENT, they'll go, oh, well, you're just a dentist. Well, fine. I'll send them somewhere else, okay? Money speaks to a certain degree. Can you imagine when, we, when I have four or five or six speech pathologists working in my company, how many TNAs we're going to be sending out? Yeah, well, that money speaks. I haven't started with it. Basically, uh, my attitude is if you've got a three-year-old and they're, you know, you've got monster tonsils or they're showing symptoms, uh, I do it. I mean... It's a give and a take. Someone can say, oh, they need it for, you know, I was told by different doctors that like age two to three, that's all you really need for the tonsils and adenoids. And then I've heard others say, oh, seven or eight. But then I'm sitting here going, wait, we're going to wait for this kid to become, have the neurocognitive deficit so we can wait for the tonsils to do their job. Yes, sir. Coblation? Oh, it's, they're doing it. I mean, yeah. Without, they'll know, you talk to an ENT about coblation, they know exactly what it is. I, I talked to an ENT, Dr. Stearman, and she's, she went to a seminar up in New York, and she was saying that there's maybe another procedure less traumatic. But Google coblation, comorbidities, regrowth, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's no biggie. I think they have like a 3 or 4% regrowth rate, very low. So, but rapid palatal expansion. You want, you know, basically, if you're going to do a tonsil TNA, you want to do a rapid palatal at the same time. In fact, a pre, another slide on here. One study showed that doing or starting ortho first and then doing the TNA got a better result than doing the TNA and then the ortho. But then y'all, y'all heard of Christian Gimeno? I mean, he's kind of like the father of this. My God, along with Dement, he gave obstructive sleep apnea the name. He said, Yeah, I don't care what what you do first, just do it. Pediatric, I think I had this on the previous lecture, for non-obese children is a disorder, of, uh, it's a facial growth disorder. Yes, sir. What? Yeah, it is. No, I haven't. Okay. She's going to. <laughs> I'm chicken. <laughs> well, well, 
Well, yeah. Great. No, the, we want that. We want that definitely because this is something we need definitely, period, here in society. And, and I'd love to talk with you afterwards about this with what I'm doing. But, no, as far as tongue-tied, yeah, I mean, if it's like I said, in Brazil, when, as soon as they're born, if you're tongue-tied, they clip it. And if you can't do breastfeeding, you better believe you do that because that's the whole way you get the intrinsic muscle tone to prevent all of this. Well, the one thing that, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and once again, I'm a neophyte to a certain degree in the myofunctional field. I mean, I'm just applying it with what my overall sleep aspect, you know, therapy is. But that I'll depend on with a pediatrician. And, and I've got Dr. Kang, who's the head of sleep at Dell Children's Hospital. He's coming to my 24 seminar. He's excited because he's never heard any of this stuff. His nurse was just going, what, what? So, I mean, it's in, I've got the Laura Ferguson, who is the uh, associate dean of faculty of Texas A&M School of Medicine. She appointed me as a assistant. They don't know what to do with me yet. I haven't done anything, I'm sure, as a dentist in a medical school. But, hey, great. But she's a pediatrician. Yeah, but she's a pediatrician. Now, for her to be a pediatrician involved with pediatric residencies, that's why I want to get this thing, because if I can get this into the medical schools, that's, that's big time. I showed this slide earlier, basically mouth breathing causes upper and lower airway instability. Boom, tells you right off the bat. I used to not, for adults, worry about if you could breathe through your mouth, hey, that's fine. You know, why put you through surgery? Now it's like I talked with an ENT, Peter Scholl. I said, Peter, I swallowed a Kool-Aid. I'm your best friend. We had a guy, who, a patient who couldn't really breathe through his nose. I said, you get in there and see Peter yesterday and get that nose taken care of, period. The effect of nasal breathing and route of upper air resistance syndrome, once again, it's lower when you're breathing nasally. I mean, it's, there's a reason for that nose there. The absence of sleep disorder breathing associated with normal nasal breathing, once again. And, and, as we, and the interesting thing with this is, is when kids hit puberty, many times mouth breathing starts to come back. And then you get the anterior open bite. That's what it's showing here is basically post-pubertal, it's associated with mouth breathing during sleep and documentation of facial hypotonia. So you take a kid who's wearing braces, and they go ahead and they, you know, they've finished it all, but they haven't taken care of a low tone level. Then, you, you know, you dismiss them, hits puberty, and boom, it can come back again. So one of these studies shows that when you've got a, child, a kid with a particular tongue level and they're doing braces, you want to do myofunctional therapy at the same time, and you'll get less recidivism. Oral pharyngeal exercises to reduce symptoms of apnea. This was really... Uh, Oral pharyngeal exercise may be considered as a complementary therapy. I've got two patients right now. Well, one who's accepted. The other one's mother's sick, so she's got to, doesn't have time. But I had a lady in here Thursday, well, yesterday, and she's a pistol, but she's not wearing CPAP, period. There's no way. She's in great shape. She's way overweight, and she swims a mile a day, but she's still overweight, about 50, 60 pounds. But I'll probably be able to get her T90, time above 90% oxygen level on a high-resolution oximeter, down to about 90, 91%. It should be at 99. Well, she wants to be in good shape. She wants to, you know, take care of herself. So she's not wearing CPAP, so we're going to do myofunctional therapy. And this study, there's one study, I believe it's, it's a little farther down. They cut the AHI from 23 to 13, I believe. But like I told her, I have no guarantees, but if I can improve you 5% just by using exercises for a year, that gets you up to the 95%, say, covered. What's, you know, it's the parts of the puzzle. That's your, you have a 5% less chance of having a stroke, and you're age 50 now. I'm looking at you when you're my age. Oral facial exercises significantly reduce symptoms. So this, once again... This is a study where you, you uh, put it in conjunction with orthodontics, and you, it's highly effective in maintaining closure of the anterior open bite. You get that anterior open bite opening again. Now you get a low tongue level. You, you know, it's, it, 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 the head bone's connected to the neck bone. You start looking at these, and once again, I, I put in red, premature babies, mouth breathing, abnormal placement of the tongue, hypotony of the tongue muscle. It's just repeat, repeat. And the point is, with, pre with preemies, they, they really can't breastfeed. So if you're not breastfeeding, the deal with breastfeeding is when you're doing uh, 
when that child's breastfeeding, that tongue, it's hard to get milk out of a breast, so that tongue is going to splay. And when it, and it, it uses a peristaltic movement. Well, it's splayed doing a peristaltic movement. That soft, hard palate is going to widen, which widens the posterior airway space. When you bottle feed, it's a pumping action. And it, as such, you're going to create a high palatal arch, which is a narrow posterior airway space. So you're predisposing your population. Brian Palmer, I don't know if any of y'all ever knew him. He and I were friends for 15 years. He was an international lecturer for the La Leche Society, but he was a nut with this stuff. And I always promised him I'd always mention this in whatever lecture I gave. But I think he's, his hobby was studying muscle attachments. Ex-professional football player in Canada. I think he went to the Hall of Fame. Then he became a dentist. Then he's studying skulls. Guy's nuts. But he's a great guy. Let's see. Different study, same thing, mouth breathing, abnormal tongue position, facial hypotonia, high narrow palate, premature infants. This is where hygienists can come in really well as far as triaging things and ask questions. Yes, ma'am. When you have it, and I'm no expert with this from what I've read, when a child's born, the eustachian tube, I believe, is at about the same level as the hard palate or just barely above it. As, you, as the child ages, the eustachian tube moves higher. So if you take a newborn and you're sitting there with a bottle in their mouth and that eustachian tube is low, you're going to get milk in that eustachian tube. Gee, what a, I mean, you might as well just put some uh, uh, auger in there for, you know, as a culture medium. And so when you've got a child that's being breastfed, you know, it's, in a different sense, you're not overloading and drowning the child as such. Children, I was told, and from what I read, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, if you have a child that's grinding their teeth, they're trying to pull the tonsils off the eustachian tube with the tensor via the palatini, so they're making the grinding sound with that. So if you hear a child clenching, you know, bruxing, you want to get rid of the tonsils because you're, you know, you're closing the eustachian tube off because of the tonsillar situation. Yeah, adenoids and tonsils, TNA. This is from that one study. By age 7, 40 to 100 percent more likely to have issues with ADD, ADHD. Children age 4, if it's not done, 20 to 60 percent. Like I said in the previous lecture, children, you, know, you have a 4 or 5 year old still wet in the bed, it's probably airway issue. Of course, the look at, patient looks like you're like you're nuts. No, not at all. Well, I've got one parent right now who doesn't want her child to have uh, tonsillectomy, the surgery, and the kid shows symptoms. I had lunch with a lady whose sister, the kids got shadowed. I mean, just right down the line. I'm going to send her some research, send her this research. But I haven't at this point. This is the uh, uh, questionnaire. And to me, this is something every hygienist should be asking because they're sitting there scraping teeth. Nobody's talking, you know, or she's just kind of blabbing. And to me, this is something that she should be asking right off the bat. Okay, any questions on that segment? With myofunctional therapy, what I'm looking at when the patient's going to come in, and I'm looking at adults, Dr. is going to be dealing with the kids. But she's going to be treating both of them. But when I have an adult that comes in, I'm looking for plumb line. I'm, looking, I'm asking them to swallow. I want to see what the mentalis does, if they have lip seal. I want to go ahead and ask them where their tongue level is. Okay, and I'm using that, and I also the way I check for lip top, for tongue tie, I ask someone to open as wide as they can, and I'll take a ruler and measure inner incisal distance. And then I'll go ahead and ask them to put their tongue up in the spot between, you know, the valley between the first and second rugae. Ask them to open again. If they can't get 60% opening, boom, they're going next door to Dr. Odell for surgery. Because when you're pulling the jaw forward for oral for oral appliance therapy, if that tongue is tied, it can't move with you. So I want to have freedom. Another way to check is this. Uh, with myofunctional therapy, all these exercises are named very sophisticated names. You know, Joy did this because you're dealing mostly with children. Like peanut butter rub, you take your tongue and you rub your top of your mouth with it. And One thing is called jawbreaker, but you watch me. I'm going to take my tongue and go as far as you can off to the side. You don't see my jaw move, do you? Someone's tongue-tied, when they go side to side with that, boy, that jaw just goes because it's tied. So the thing is, is that if anybody wants these exercises to have uh, lingual phrenectomy, just send me an email. And uh, did I, did I, if I didn't have my email on there, it's dr.denbar, 
dr.denbar at austinapnea.com. And I'll send you a copy of those exercises. But you want to have them start those exercises immediately or the day of the surgery so you don't get reattachment. I feel like a dog for the last four years. I've been sending people off, but I didn't know to have, you know. But here we learn. This gentleman for combined therapy, has anyone here ever done combination treatment? Okay, I've been doing it for 16 years. The eight articles written, I've got a couple of them. And this gentleman's low SAT was 31% at night. He had an HI about 55. Uh, he drives in from Houston. But this is the tap-pap chair side. This is the swivel. This is what Thornton got rid of. I bought his whole inventory. There's some guys here in the country that aren't happy with me. But the point is, is this is what I wear at night. It swivels. You can sleep on your side, your stomach. There's no torquing whatsoever. It's great. And when an oral appliance like this with a combined therapy, you can go ahead and uh, since you're pulling the jaw forward, you're reducing your pressures dramatically. The concept of CPAP is to blow air through your nose, push your tongue out of the way, and inflate your lungs. I've already got the tongue pulled out of the way. So given that situation, uh, in, in some of the studies show, uh, this, this is a CPAP Pro. It has no, no uh, studies on it whatsoever. I've not done one. I've got four sitting in the office I was given to me, but I don't like to put anything in the mouth that doesn't have any evidence base behind it at all. That's just me. When you're using combined therapy, you eliminate the headgear, the chin strap. You're going to reduce your pressures. If you come in with pressures about 18, I mean, if people have that, I mean, like I said, you can blow the leaves off the driveway with that. I'll knock them down to about 9 or 10. My normal pressures are 12. I, on average, they're 6 now. I mean, it's great. It's like taking a deep breath. I mean, it feels good. So, and I'll turn most every BiPAP into a CPAP. Now, physicians aren't used to this. Nobody knows how to do this. There, there are probably about 20 of us in the country with any experience. I've done about 250 cases. I do between three, anywhere from about three to, to eight a month. And I've got nine CPAP units in my office that I loan to patients as a part of my treatment. If anyone's interested in doing that, let me know. I'll tell you how to get them wholesale price. But the point is, is I'm actually on contract with Seton Hospital System here in Austin for combined therapy. And the thing is, is that a lot of patients don't have a CPAP. And when you get someone coming in who's got an AHI of, say, 25, uh, their pressures are 12 or 13, you know, you're looking at a good chance they're going to need combined therapy. So if it's not, since I have the unit in my office, I loan it to them as a part of my fee for 30 days. I have all the software. We do the downloads and forward it to the physicians, and they like it. And it sets you apart from the average guy who's taken two seminars, you know. It provides a stable platform for your nasal pillows. The big issues with CPAP is when people roll over, they get fair-complected women get imprints. They get dry eyes because of the leaks into their eyes. If a woman's in her 50s or 60s with thinning hair, it pulls the hair out the back of their head. Uh, I've got something here I'll show you. It's kind of, I thought it was kind of neat. I've done, I don't know if anyone else in the country is doing this, but I've done three or four cases successfully. You get significant reduction of air, air pressures and leaks. You reduce the movement of your jaw forward. Comfortable side sleeping. It allows for easy titration. When you're doing that, I've trained the sleep labs. You basically, when you're doing a titration, and if anybody wants it, send me an email. Uh, you start at your position where you think you've got the patient, and I do that with oximetry. And on combined therapy, we also have the CPAP download. Send them back to the physician, depending on their medical history, because when you're doing combined therapy, a lot of these people have COPD, AFib, you know, a couple stents. These are sick people. And so when they go in the lab, you start at a position, and you do really one full turn, which is half a millimeter movement after each REM cycle. And the tech will start to see how they get better, they get worse, and then they see what's the best position for the jaw, and then they start varying your air pressures. And so you want to have a jaw position where the air pressure is acceptable. So you've got two factors there that you're combining. And it doesn't cost them a nickel. John Remmers, who developed very well known in the field, and I, forget, I think it's a Zephyr, I forget, but it's $6,000 and it does it for you. All right, a lot of labs aren't going to spend 6000 It's well received. I've got over an 80% success rate with patients. And for fibromyalgia, do you all ever have females that have sensitive scalp from fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome? You know, you touch the scalp and they have a hard time combing their hair. Uh, 
Well, I've got a picture I'll show you in a second. What you do is you just take that upper unit that stuck out. You remember that you saw that? All right. Don't use the lower at all. You take the hook off of it, easy to do. You take jet acrylic, and you make an anterior orthotic with it. Put them in balanced occlusion, right? Then you go ahead and just put it in the mouth, and you have your tap pap attached to it. If you have, this can only work if you have a patient who has not had a U triple P. You all know what that is. Surgery in the back to remove the palate, soft palate. Because when you blow air through your nose, it, most all apneics have elongated soft palates. And the air pressure going through the nose will push the soft palate against the posterior area of your tongue, create an inherent seal. So you got a great vehicle. It, it holds it here. Nothing's touching the face. Nothing's touching their scalp. They can sleep on their side, upside down, stomach, doesn't matter. I'll show you, I've got, I'm ahead of myself, but I'll show you on one case that we did this. This was a study that uh, was my idea with the University of North Carolina. We haven't published it yet, but we showed that from nearly one year to four years, we had, uh, my practice had an 81% success rate, but we took the AHIs down from nearly 50 to two and a half. That's pretty good. Overall, we had a 66, nearly 67% success rate. I think I'm better because I have, I'm the only one that has CPAP in the office to be able to follow these patients. Now, sometimes it's a pain in the rear end to have to go track it back down, but we solved that because we now have their credit card. Actually, one patient I had to actually threaten with file a police report for stealing an $1,800 device, but they did bring it back. It's always amazing if those phone calls get responses. Well, when someone keeps it for so long, you just figure, okay, they're not interested, so. This was a study where using a combined therapy with an oral appliance plus the CPAP unit, you're getting reduced velopharyngeal resistance, which is right at the area of the uvula, more so than you would with either a nasal pillow or a face mask by itself. I just had a case, drove up from South San Antonio, a gentleman's HI was in the low 30s, and even with, sonometer, even with 14 centimeters of pressure, which is an awful lot, they could not get his HI down below 32. So he came down, his physician in San Antonio thinks I'm a quack, but he, he'd never heard of what I'm doing, so he wouldn't work with us. So I brought him down, sent him to one of our doctors, and we did combined therapy. I have his AHI down within five days to 1.1, fully controlled. Guy's on cloud nine, I'm his best friend. This was an individual, typical case that we see, frequent heavy snoring, high blood pressure, atrial fib, ischemic heart disease, sleep apnea. She stopped the breathing on her back 86 times an hour, HIF 60, low oxygen's 83, would not wear CPAP at all. Now, I have prescriptions in my charge for the oral appliance and for combined therapy. And on the prescription for combined therapy, I write combined therapy, set pressures four to 20 or whatever for the CPAP so it's an actual order. We went ahead and put it in on a gentleman in the first week, as, or the lady, we had her HI down to 5.7, pressures at 5.6. She's using it eight and a half hours a night with three minutes of leakage. I mean, that's ungodly. And a year later, look at that. Not pretty good. This one, there's a reason I'm, I put this one up here, 75-year-old uh, lady, NADARS 58%. That's pretty low. But once again, I have to treat to the REM, because that's where you get your restorative sleep. Even if we're doing uh, positional therapy, the crudest form of positional therapy is when your wife does this at night. But you get you off your back, so you're on your side. But even so, in REM, you can't do that. So I've got to treat to an HI of 72. But look at the difference here. I, we always do a pretreatment oximetry at whatever they use at night for sleep apnea. It's whether it's CPAP, I don't care, just whatever. Her time above, a T90 is time above 90%. You want that at 99% or more. It was 78 to start out with, which is horrible. We brought her 3.75 millimeters, or to, out to 5.75 millimeters. Look at how it dropped. And coming back just, it, that, that should be 0.5 millimeters. Well, no, yeah, we came back half a millimeter, three quarters of a millimeter. Look how that just changed. So when someone just says, yeah, we put it in there and they stop snoring. Subjective symptoms mean nothing to me. I don't care if you feel good. I mean, it's nice. Don't get me wrong. You want, we always stop breathing, you know, from snoring. But if someone stops snoring, they feel better. I don't care. It's great. But as you can see with it, she felt better when she was at 39%. 
subjective symptoms mean nothing. Airway patency is another story. And you can, the 800 pound grill on the block is getting that airway fixed. When that airway is fixed, if they're still not having problems, it could be hypothyroidism, it could be idiopathic, it could be medications, who knows? But this is what we need to deal with here. So anyone who says, yeah, I put it in and he stops snoring and we let him go home, that tells you right off the bat the dentist doesn't know what they're doing. I'm subtle with my comments, I'm sorry. Combined therapy, as you can see, we got her fully treated, we got the HI down below one which to me is very successful, and look at the leaks. You don't get leaks with this. This was the case on the lady with fibromyalgia. I just had a gentleman, he's a dentist here in Austin, he's got TMJ issues. We tried with the upper and lower uh, uh, appliance, and it was just too much, even as a TMJ situation. Uh, he's one of the few that just couldn't handle it. So we took the upper, or the lower away. You can see I've got real nice contacts. And a little bit, in this case, a little bit of mild cuspid rise, but in general, I just make it flat plane, and they're happy with it. So we can conquer, conquer two, or two birds with one stone. You've heard about the prefabricated boil and bite appliances? Okay, let's see. Uh, that the ENTs use for $1,800 that they put in in five minutes, and they let their uh, medical assistants do it, then tell them to go see your dentist if you have a problem? Yeah, those ones. Um, Failure rate, 69%, cannot be recommended. Here's a good one from their own journal. Safety is unknown at this time from 2010. Here's another one. Yeah, they're cheaper. Yeah, got a high acceptance rate initially. But let's see, if that other one would, at three quarters of a millimeter, and this is a boil and bite, what if it gets a little too hot under the sink and it moves a little bit? And if, have any of y'all ever worked with thermal, uh, um, Thermocryl for the tap appliance. I've done probably over a thousand of those. After six months, they start to break down a little, and the typical thing is you'll see a little movement on the front area, and the patient compensates by having to bring the jaw a little farther forward. Well, you just shot yourself in the foot. So I'm speaking next week at the Texas Society of Sleep Professionals, and there are a couple of ENTs that do these there, so we'll see if they still refer to me after tomorrow, after next week. So I've kind of gone through, I, I talk a little fast, but uh, kind of gone through this. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. So do you feel there's any advantage uh, when you do physically caffeine class mounting up like Facebook is Lord, no. I used to manufacture the taps in my, year, in my office for two years, tap one and tap two, until a piece broke and someone swallowed it. And the phys first thing out of the physician's mouth was, I think we need to call the FDA. It wasn't my office, it was some other one. And then Thornton, who I was one of five offices that manufactured, and he pulled in everyone and said they couldn't make them anymore. Uh, no, you got so much play there, it's ridiculous, and that's what you want to have. Now, the thing is, is that if you have a patient, do you do the taps? What do you do if they have uh, need combined therapy? No, what do you do if they need combined therapy? Well, what do you do? They say, I'm not wearing, see, all my patients, they're not going to wear CPAP because of the head, head, you know, all the garbage on their head. So what do you do then? Yeah. Well, see, what's going to happen in the future is that this is, this is dealing with medical end of therapy. And so you're dealing with, con I'm a contractor provider, I'm an Aetna Signet and Humana doctor. And in my contracts, they say I get paid $2,200. If I do a Herbst and they need combined therapy, I'm not going to use a CPAP Pro. That means, and this happened to me twice, that means I then have to go back and make a TAP appliance for double the lab bill. And, you know, and when you're sitting here with a fixed fee structure, you know, that's why I like the Narvel is a great appliance. The, the lab bill is $565. Is it time? Okay, so you see what I'm saying? You've got to add the business into it, into it also. But no, I don't mount any. The lab mounts them, yes, but I take a very simple AccuBite. And if you want, I mean, I'll explain it to you outside. Thank you all very much for your time.